Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you all to this uh, webinar event with Gary Jones. We're going to wait a couple of more minutes um, and see if we get a few more people. We've got about 20 registered, and we should be um, adding a few more shortly. So we'll give it another couple of minutes, so stay tuned. Hey everyone, we're going to be starting in just another minute or so. Uh, we're just going to give people one more minute to um, join the webinar. And could somebody type in the chat box that you can hear me speaking? I just want to make sure the audio is working all right. Okay, um, I think we ought to get started here. Um, nobody typed in the chat box that, they, that you could hear me, so I'm really hoping you can hear me. Um, anyway, I am Rosalind Bandy. I'm the sustainability uh, leader at TLMI, and I'm very pleased to have with us today Gary Jones, who is the Environmental Health and Safety Director for the Specialty Graphics Imaging Association, or SGIA. Gary's been doing EHS for over 30 years, specifically in the printing industry. Uh, so uh, he is really an expert, and, and most of you probably know his name, if not know him personally. Um, I also want to let you know that he will be speaking at our um, the TLMI annual meeting in the fall, and at that event he's going to be talking about the Sustainable Green Printing Partnership. Um, uh, just a couple of housekeeping issues. We have everyone on mute. Um, so if you have a question, um, I invite you to type it into the um, the webinar box, the chat box, and we will have time at the end of Gary's presentation to um, to answer those questions. We'll have uh, probably about 10 minutes. So as you come up with those questions, type them in, and I will be saving them for review at the end. Um, so Gary, I'd like to hand it over to you, and um, and again, everyone is muted, so type your questions into the chat box. Go ahead, Gary. Thank great. you. Great. Uh, great. Thanks, Roz, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited to, uh, to to be invited to give this update presentation to you. As Roz says, we'll have time for questions at the end, so please feel free as I go through. If you think of a question, type it in the chat box, and uh, we'll get to those at the end of the program. And so what we've, uh, the way I designed this program today was to basically 
uh, look at a midterm exam. I know we're a little bit past the midterm, so to speak, with respect to Trump, but I thought it would be worthwhile to take a look at what's occurred, uh, at least as far as EPA and OSHA is concerned, with respect to, um, I would say, the deregulatory agenda that uh, that uh, that Trump has instituted uh, since becoming elected uh, president. And uh, we also want to take a look at um, what's going on with respect to I would say uh, the China blue sky impact, huge. Uh, we're going to just touch upon that, spend a little bit of time on OSHA, uh, regulatory reform activities, uh, some enforcement activity, uh, primarily what's going on with respect to the, uh, to the increase in penalties, um, touch base briefly on the injury reporting requirements, uh, again, a little bit on HASCOM, and also something that's really rather significant and very timely is the lockout tagout standard and the significance. And at the end, uh, we'll go through the amputation um, national access program and touch upon that. I also will tell you, and I warn you that I have a video. I typically incorporate a video into my presentations. It's a safety video. So at the end, it's a safety video. It is a um, it's a, a graphic video. Uh, it's not gory. It's graphic, but it does illustrate, uh, I would say, common practices that we see with printing equipment to illustrate concerns we have with safety, which will explain. It will be self-explanatory when we talk about the amputation part of it. So, um, if our if the statistics hold true, half the folks on this call today are pleased that Trump was elected president, and half the folks are not. Um, as we know, President Trump was elected uh, in in, in uh, as our latest president, and one of the campaign promises that uh, Trump had was to cut regulation, basically cut red tape. And this was a photo that uh, was a recent photo that illustrated uh, really the growth of environmental, or, or just re not environmental regulation, regulations in general from 1960 through uh, today, which I would say this, uh, this pile would not be the representative of what's going on with the Trump administration. I would say probably the last year of the Obama administration. And typically whenever you have administrations change, uh, the, at the end of that administration, because I know that they w have lost that election, o Obama ha Obama had termed out, so he knew that he wasn't going to get reelected. Um, there's a rush to push out a lot of regulations like unfinished business. But this illustrates really the magnitude of the regulations that uh, that are imposed on, on business and industry and the number of pages that are in what's called the Federal Register. And the Federal Register is basically the, 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 the record of the business of the day of the government. And one comes out every day that the government's open and it's a record of, of regulations and policies and things like that. So, as we said, Trump... Um, I was elected uh, uh, in 2016. He took office in 2017, and shortly after his inauguration, he issued several what are called executive orders. Now, executive orders are basically um, uh, memos, so to speak, or, or as the name applies, an order to the agencies. The, the arm of the presidency is under the administration. That's one third of the government, and all the just about every single regulatory agency. Uh, reports to the president. And so the president ha wields a lot of power over these agencies. And so when he issues an executive order, it's basically marching orders to each of the agencies. And so a couple executive orders, which I wanted to highlight, was that uh, uh, one, when the one was issued January 30th, shortly after he was inaugurated, was basically, he said to his agencies, is that for every one regulation you put in, you have to remove two off the books. And that's not necessarily unheard of because that's something that's done in Canada. And, and, and what happened is that it really put a almost a, a, a complete stop on regulatory activity because as each agency had to meet this new mandate, they had to work hard at looking at, hey, if we want to put a new reg in, we've got to take two off. Uh, there was also... Um, uh, executive order that was issued in February that, uh, of 2017 that, uh, that made each agency take a hard look at their regulations and look for opportunities to streamline those regulations, look for opportunities to, re to reduce the regulatory burden that they have on business and industry. Uh, and then also from an environmental perspective, a couple executive orders, one was on the waters of the United States, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then the second one, which actually the regulation was just issued 
um, last week, end of last week, executive order on promoting energy independence and economic growth. And essentially, what that executive order did was look at um, energy exploration. It looked at uh, pipelines, and it also looked at uh, removing the uh, or revising and removing the existing greenhouse gas regulations that were put in place, and revising those regulations to uh, promote energy independence and economic growth. And uh, and that that uh, power the the um, uh, Affordable Clean Energy Act, uh, regulation was just literally the, uh, on the 19th uh, was uh, put in place. We're going to talk about that from a numbers perspective because I like statistics, right? So basically, uh, through fiscal year 2018, so again, uh, we get this data once per year. So through fiscal year 2018, which ended September 30th, began October 1st of last year, across all federal agencies, 12 outdated unnecessary regulations were eliminated for every one new. So again, the executive order said two for one. The agencies far exceeded that and said we've removed 12 for every one. Uh, they, uh, the total was they eliminated 176 regulations, withdrew or delayed actions on 640. 48 regulations, and then since January of 2017, since Trump took office, a total of 22, uh, 2200, 2,253 pending actions were delayed or withdrawn by the agencies across the board. Uh, from a cost perspective, uh, basically what it meant in fiscal year, again, uh, 2018, basically the deregulatory actions uh, are estimated to have saved the uh, business industry more than $23 billion in regulatory costs for the nation's employers. So think about that. that since Trump took office, the deregulatory cost savings to uh, the economy were $23 billion. Now, if we compare that um, in terms of in terms of the, uh, well, taking that further, since taking office from January 2017, uh, that number climbs to $33 billion. So again, the fiscal year 2018, $23 billion uh, from January when Trump took office, $33 billion. If you compare that to at least the numbers that, that, that have been presented, uh, during the first 21 months, uh, President Barack Obama's administration imposed on net uh, uh, more than, and I, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I, I have the, uh, the number is, is, uh, uh, I gotta, I have the number hidden, um, 245. Sorry about that. When I reformatted my slides, $245 billion in regulatory. So if you compare the two administrations, um, about equal time frame, uh, Trump, uh, Trump's deregulatory activity has saved $33 billion, where President Obama's uh, administration imposed $245 billion in regulatory costs. So obviously you can see uh, there's a distinct uh, difference between the philosophies of the two uh, of the two administrations. From an EPA perspective, EPA has said, well, we've eliminated 67 rules. And I saw a number recently that that's climbed now to 84 rules. Uh, and so at that time, 45 or more in the process of being eliminated. So we want to talk about a few of these. The, the ones that are always in policy, which I think is a very positive change, um, we, we want to touch touch base upon that and as I said the waters the US and also the clean power plan Th those were key uh, those were key regulations and then uh, interesting enough uh, which is a rather innocent waste stream aerosol cans uh, they have proposed to make a universal waste to reduce the regulatory burden associated with uh, disposal of air empty aerosol cans or aerosol cans that would be deemed to be empty. And since uh, since then, the ozone standard has been issued, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the uh, ozone standard. Okay, first up, waters of the U.S. Now, you might say, hmm, why do we really care about the waters of the United States? Well, what's interesting is that the the concept of waters of the United States, I think, is, is extremely important from from two respects. One is that there are regulations that deal with uh, discharges of, of water into what are called navigable waterways. Now, the Clean Water Act of 1972 basically defined navigable waterways as something that was large enough to float a boat, off, boat on and it's used in commerce. And over the years, since 1972, that definition was expanded through regulatory action and court rulings to include smaller waterways, wetlands, and including wetlands that not, are not always wet, for example, frequently wet. And you would delineate those by looking at the vegetation. So for example, if you had cattails for part of the year, um, that would be considered a wetland. And basically, uh, if you want to disturb 
the waterway, including a partial wetland, you had to get permission via a permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and from EPA to disturb those those uh, wetlands. Well, if um, we when we fast forward, uh, due to a Supreme Court rule, the Obama administration issued a rule. Uh, basically, in 2015, that that took that concept and expanded it even further, and they included some terms which are kind of a bit of a head scratcher. But basically, they were saying waters that are adjacent to navigable waterways or the tributaries, or have a, what's called a significant nexus, whatever that means, because it wasn't clearly defined in the regulation. Uh, traditional navigable waterways. Now, uh, if you took and extended that concept, what that meant is that if you were going to have a land disturbance, okay, so waters that are adjacent or, or a significant nexus to a navigable waterway, so basically what they did in that regulation is they said if you're within 4,000 feet of a traditional navigable waterway and you're going to be doing land disturbance that would have, a, have an impact, you actually had to get a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA to do that land disturbance. So think about that. If you were going to, say, build a new facility, uh, or if you're going to add on to an existing facility, or say you wanted to pave part of it for a parking lot, and you were within 4,000 feet of a, of a traditional navigable waterway, you actually had to get a permit from both those agencies to proceed to do that. Well, as you might imagine, that's over a half mile away. And, and when you look at the 4,000 feet, right? So that triggered multiple lawsuits. Um, and, and you'll find typically, uh, and to some extent, I feel a little sorry for EPA, but it's hard to feel completely sorry for them. But every time that they issue some type of regulation, it doesn't matter what administration you're in, a Democratic administration, a Republican administration, uh, so they're getting sued. Um, it's either industry suing them, the states are suing them, or environmental groups are suing them. Usually every time they do something, uh, they get sued. So when this rule came out, there were uh, multiple lawsuits that were filed, um, and, and there were actually some stays that were issued. A stay is a very important concept legally because it's basically a cease and desist. I'll, I won't bore you with all the details because certain parts of the country got stayed, other parts it didn't. Uh, but EPA, under because of the executive order from, from President Trump, said, well, we're going to fix this, right? So we're going to do this in a two-step process. The first step, uh, we're going to replace the state definition and go back to what we had prior to that, uh, which is kind of what I reviewed. And or not, we get rid of the significant nexus in the 4,000 feet. And then the second step was to undertake a rulemaking that it reevaluates the waters of U.S. definition and actually issue a definition. So both of those rules have not been finalized. We expect those to go final very soon. Uh, but they were both proposed. They took comments on those. Uh, they're considering those comments, and, and they actually had to reopen the step one process. They took additional comment, uh, and again, I, uh, my guess is we're going to go back to the prior to the two, 2015. In fact, I suspect that we may even see a more narrowing of the definition of what constitutes um, a wetland, so to speak, or a navigable waterway, Back going back more towards the uh, 1972 original intent of the Clean Water Act. So again, uh, we'll have to pay attention to how that unfolds. Very quickly, the Clean Power Plan and CAFE standards. The Clean Power Plan, basically, the Clean Power Plan was uh, a rule that was issued uh, near the uh, end of the Obama administration. And basically, it set greenhouse gas emission limits for new and reconstructed power plants. The entire intent of that regulation was to eliminate uh, coal-fired power plants because the standards were set so high that coal-fired power plants could not meet the limit. And that was in, in, in the stated goal, the intended goal of the regulation. However, again, when that regulation was issued, uh, there were uh, 19 states and industry groups filed suit because we still get a significant amount of our energy in the U.S. from coal. Now, at one time, it was close to 45 percent. Now, that's dropped uh, to about 27 percent, and the projections are that the coal fire power is going to go down, but yet it's still not zero, and it is a significant source of power to the U.S. So, uh, this actually made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court issued a stay in February of 2016. Basically, a stay is a cease and desist order. And uh, at that time, um, the new administration, well, the new administration wasn't in yet, uh, and the court said that we are going to uh, allow the lower courts to decide on the merits, but this regulation can't go forward. So, it was kind of frozen in time. 
The new administration came in, Trump issued his executive order and says we need to deal with this clean power plan. So uh, from that time period to just June 19th of 2019, when EPA issued what was called the Affordable Clean Energy Plan, and that's the regulation that was just released. It replaces the Clean Power Plan, uh, and it provides a lot more flexibility. And what's interesting about the Clean Power Plan under the Obama administration, the fact that the Supreme Court issued a stay was unprecedented, uh, generally, with respect to these types of regulations. And what it really meant was that um, the Supreme Court felt that uh, legally that rule could not stand. Uh, they, they, their opinion was that uh, this was that they were EPA was outside the bounds of what they were legally allowed to do. That they went, they stretched too far with the regulatory requirements, and that if it came to the Supreme Court for a hearing, uh, it would be denied and sent back to EPA. So um, even though there's a lot of concern and controversy about the new Affordable Clean Energy Plan that was issued, uh, the chances of the Clean Power Plan last uh, surviving a Supreme Court review uh, were were really really slim. Um, so basically what the new rule says is that uh, they're going to focus on what's called heat rate improvements and think of that as improved efficiency. Uh, what's, what EPA is suggesting is that through this regulation and the natural forces that are working because what's going on as we know uh, natural gas is plentiful because of the exploration that's going on the costs are lower and uh, we have existing cold fire power plants that are aging out and then they're, they're being replaced with natural gas so there is a natural progression that's going on, but EPA is suggesting that uh, they're going to we're going to get CO2 emission reductions uh, reductions by as much as 35 percent below 20,005 levels, which is fairly comparable to the Clean Power Plan. It's just that the, what EPA did this time is that it should uh, withstand uh, legal scrutiny, but we'll find out because everybody's lining up to sue EPA. Uh, very briefly, briefly about CAFE standards. CAFE standards are basically uh, the corporate uh, area fuel emission standards, and, and those are the um, th those are what the automobile manufacturers all have to meet across the board corporately. Again, another um, um, uh, uh, part of the uh, executive order that that uh, Trump had was to uh, roll back on the CAFE standards, and basically. Uh, right before the Obama administration left, they put in place pretty stringent standards uh, through 2026. And what a Trump administration has proposed was to freeze the levels at the 2020 at the 2020 amount uh, through 2026, and that's met with mixed reviews. And some of the even some of the automobile manufacturers have said they would prefer to see a little bit more aggressive number. So the final rule hasn't come out, so we'll have to see how that. And, and also there's a big argument going on right now with California because California has received a waiver, the only state in the country that has traditionally historically received a waiver where they can set their own fuel efficiency standards. And so California wants to be more aggressive than EPA. Uh, so you have a big uh, uh, discussion, shall we say, a controversy going on right now between EPA and California regarding the CAFE standards. Another regulation that's kind of in that same area uh, is the ozone depleting substances, the greenhouse gas regulations for refrigerants. Again, the Obama administration said we're going to phase out what are called hydrofluorocarbons. Now think of the current refrigerants that you're using, and those are the current refrigerants we're using. Now if you go back to the ozone depleting substances regulations that have been phased in previously, you re will recall that we've gone through a change already in one round of refrigerants, right? So uh, for your automobile, for example, instead of, um, instead of using um, uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, Freon 12, you're now using uh, Freon 134A, right? So some of the cars had to have their air conditioning systems retrofitted. All the newer cars are accepting the 134A. So that's basically a hydrofluorocarbon. So then what this regulation was designed to do is eliminate those and the existing hydrofluorocarbons because of the concern with respect to greenhouse warming, greenhouse gas warming, because these gases have a high greenhouse gas warming potential. Um, they also added new requirements for leak rate repair, record keeping, etc. Um, so fast forward, the rule was issued, uh, the suit was brought, uh, the U.S. District Court uh, for Columbia struck the rule down saying the EPA did not have the statutory authority to issue the rule. And this was kind of a common theme in the Obama administration. The Obama administration really was, um, shall we say, very 
um, uh, aggressive in their interpretation of what the Clean Air Act allowed them to do. And in, in many instances, um, the court said, nope, uh, you went way beyond your legal mandate. So this was another example of where they went on their, way beyond their legal mandate. So EPA issued a proposed regulation in light of the court decision to rescind the HFC applicability. Now, two things, very important. Uh, some states, California and Washington, have passed legislation keeping the phase out. So again, we have this tension between the federal government and you have some states, and of course we have states' rights. And some states are very aggressive in trying to address greenhouse gas issues and greenhouse gas emissions. So two of them, uh, California and Washington, just passed legislation that said, well, wait a minute here, even though the federal government's going to back off on this, as a state, we're not. So it's very important to pay attention with respect to where you are and what state and what legislation is being passed because if you have to do servicing on refrigerants and if you have to get new uh, cooling systems, uh, chillers, et cetera, uh, you gotta pay attention. And the second thing which I put in bold here is that the leak reporting disposal record keeping uh, for existing refrigerants still applies. The only thing that got rolled back was the application of the of the regulation to hydrofluorocarbons. What did not get rolled back was the re reporting requirements. So if I'm getting rid of an appliance, if I have a chiller unit, if I have an air conditioning unit that has more than five pounds of Freon, even with current Freon, the HFC Freon, I need to be able to demonstrate that that was disposed of properly and that the Freon uh, was evacuated from that uh, piece of equipment. So that still applies. Um, and then the leak reporting requirements apply if you, for any material, any system that you have more than 50 pounds of refrigerant. Okay, so let's move on to ozone. The ozone standard uh, was a regulation that, believe it or not, the Trump administration tried to stop, but they couldn't because the Clean Air Act actually mandates that this occur. So they wanted to put a delay in and then they were threatened to be sued by the states and then they looked at it and said, yep, we can't delay this regulation. So they went ahead and let the regulation go through. So what does this mean to us? Well, basically ozone is one of the, uh, what's called national ambient air quality standards. It's one of the, one of the pollutants that EPA uses to measure whether or not their air is dirty or clean. And ozone is a major component of smog. So really what we're talking about here uh, is, is smog. So the standard uh, that EPA has deemed uh, from 2015 was reduced to uh, 0 0.07 parts per million or 70 parts per billion. And, and, you, and that number may be completely meaningless to you. So on the next slide, I have a map that shows you the significance of what this is. And essentially what happens is once, a, once EPA does something like this, they issue a set of regulations and designation. So basically any area, any geographical area that exceeds this threshold is considered non-attainment. And if it's non-attainment, then the states have to put in place rules and regulations designed to meet the that standard. So what that means to us, and unfortunately in printing, because we use things called volatile organic compounds, those are solvents and materials in our inks and coatings, uh, those evaporate, get into the air, mixed with nitrogen oxides and in the presence of sunlight, you have the formation of ozone. So this means that any non-attainment area must put in place regulations designed to reduce emissions of VOCs and nitrogen oxides. So um, where we are with this new standard is that even though Trump tried to, and the EPA tried to stop this from going through, uh, they legally couldn't do it. And so they, so the standard went through and got changed. So really what I want to do is to have you focus on the map of the U.S. here. If you're in an area where there's a colored block, a colored block is considered a non-attainment area. These are the areas in the United States that are exceeding the threshold for ozone. What this means is that any area where you have a colored block, those states must develop regulations designed to reduce pollution, precursors as they call them, VOCs and nitrogen oxides, uh, to a sufficient quantity uh, so that they will come into attainment um, uh, in the deadline that's provided to them for the standard. And so, for example, if you look at Ohio, Ohio, uh, what's interesting is Ohio uh, was all the three major areas, Columbus, Cincinnati, and Cleveland, were in attainment with a previous standard, but because the standard got lowered, 0 0.005 parts per million, which is a very, very small amount, those areas have now gone non-attainment. Um, most of the major metropolitan areas, as you can see, are non-attainment. You have Dallas, you have Atlanta, 
um, pretty much you know the entire East Coast because of the concentration of people. Um, you have the Milwaukee area, you have Chicago, so you know it's going to be areas that are, are are generally heavily densely populated. But there's some areas that are not as densely populated, uh, but have area uh, but have sources of of pollution. So uh, these areas here. So I, I the point is is to pay attention to what's going on in the state because the state may have to, if they haven't already, impose new regulations on graphic arts sources. If they have existing uh, regulations for graphic arts, they may lower the threshold of applicability. And a lot of facilities that are at least in the Flexo world, um, many of the thresholds are, 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 are set at, at, at 100 tons per year. That's not the case across all the states. But a lot of the states um, are set at 100 tons per year, but if they lower those thresholds because they need to capture more facilities and show further emission reductions, um, you may find yourself subject to a new set of regulatory requirements. As I mentioned, the once and always in policy, this to me I think is extremely positive. The concept here is that um, if you're once subject to a regulation, but you as a company uh, do things to reduce your emissions, uh, and, and you get below that threshold at which a regulation applies, um, basically it makes sense to me that the regulations should stop applying. Well, EPA had a policy that said uh, it, once you were subject to some regulation, then uh, if you exceeded that threshold, no matter what you did, you could, you could reduce the emissions of all your pollutants down to zero, and you still had to meet the requirements. And, 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 and those requirements are both a uh, limits that you have to meet for materials. It's also record keeping. It could be testing. It could be very costly. So what EPA did is they changed the policy, um, at least for has what's called hazardous air pollutants, which are air toxics. And um, basically what they said is if your emissions drop below the thresholds of 10 for a single HAP or 25 tons for all HAPs combined, um, then you are you are no longer subject to these requirements and regulations, uh, and and you're out of you're out of the uh, you're out of that regulatory cycle. And what's the positive part of that to me, at least, is it in, it sends an encouraging signal to business and industry that if you're subject to one of these regulations, if you take positive actions, you reduce those thresholds, and you're below it, uh, then you don't have to worry about the regulation. So EPA is going to codify this policy and literally they released today the proposal uh, to mod to codify the once in always in policy because a policy can be changed based on each administration when you put a regulation in place at least what this administration has found out it's very difficult to change a regulation once it's in place and and but i would like to see this extended to the voc now this just applies to half sources uh we're going to submit comments uh, to EPA saying, in addition to hazardous air pollutants, you should extend this change to sources that emit VOCs because we have more printers who emit uh, VOC. VOC is much, uh, a much greater emission source than, say, hazardous air pollutants. So not too many printers are subject to the MAC standard, but we have a lot of printers subject to the VOC standards. And I think the concept should be, should be carried forward to those sources as well because essentially we want to be rewarding companies for reducing their emissions. Okay, e-manifest. E-manifest is something that is in place. It was launched June of, of uh, 2018, June 30th, 2018. And basically, think of this as a, an electronic version of a manifest. When you generate hazardous waste, you have to um, make sure that the waste is sent to the sent from your facility uh, through a transportation company that's licensed to a disposal company that's licensed. In order to prove that that happened, you have to do what's called a round trip manifest. And typically that was a paper manifest, which had like 10 or 11 copies. It was really hard to read. Um, and so it was a paper-based system. EPA has now transitioned into an elect electronic system. And the goal is to be completely electronic in the hazardous waste manifest uh, by 2020, eh, mid 2020 or so. Uh, so we're in the transition period. And as a facility and as a generator, if you generate hazardous waste, you may not see a difference right now, but in the very near future, uh, don't be surprised if the waste hauler shows up and wants you to uh, and, and sticks an iPad under your nose and says, we need you to sign this electronic version of the manifest. Now, in order to do that legally, you actually have to register with EPA. Uh, you have to actually go on to their website. You have to register. The strong suggestion is you register at least two and maybe three people 
that will then have the authority to sign an electronic manifest. Um, right now, what uh, all the members I've spoken to, they're still getting the paper copy. So we're kind of in a hybrid system. So when they come pick up your hazardous waste, you're still signing a paper copy. But what's happening on the back end is that the waste hauler and the disposal site are then converting that into an electronic file and uploading that to EPA electronically. And EPA reported, oh, I think like two months ago that they had received uh, over a million manifests so far electronically. So it is happening. Uh, it will come to uh, coming feature uh, feature coming to you in the very near future. Uh, what I would suggest is that uh, work with your waste hauler, contact them, see when they're looking to make the full transition, the full leap, so to speak, into electronic manifest. And, the, and then eventually, uh, like I said, they'll be sticking an iPad or something similar under your nose and wanting you to sign off electronically on the manifest. And so don't be surprised if it doesn't happen. However, you don't want this to be a surprise. You want to make sure you're talking with the vendors. You want to make sure that uh, you have yourself registered and you're set up to handle that. Okay, aerosol cans, as I talked about. This is very interesting. Aerosol cans, and, and again, you guys need to understand, um, I take great interest in this topic and, and I actually love doing this, uh, doing what we're doing here, which is doing a, a education and talking to folks. So aerosol cans are, are can be a problematic waste stream. Why? Because if I have an aerosol can and say the contents aren't completely empty, uh, and the nozzle breaks off, uh, I cannot just simply throw that in the trash as I could at home. If I have an aerosol can that's full or partially full, I have to treat that as a hazardous waste, right? And so that means I have to identify it as a hazardous waste, manage it as a hazardous waste. Uh, and if you recall, if you're paying attention, uh, there was a rash of a lot of retail, uh, think like Home Depot, pharmacies, Lowe's, etc., that uh, would take back um, ink. You know, say you bought a spray can of ink and you, um, ink. I'm sorry, paint, spray paint. Say you bought a uh, a spray can of of, of uh, paint and you, it didn't match, and you returned it back to the store. It didn't work. Returned it back to the store. Well, they were left with a whole bunch of partially and empty, so they didn't know any better. They just threw them away. Well, they got fined lots of money. I mean, six figure penalties. And so uh, after a series of these that happened, the EPA said, well, geez, why don't we make this a universal waste? And what a universal waste is in, in the world of waste is basically it's a, a, it's a waste that if you were to throw it away, it would be a hazardous waste. But if you recycle it, it's a universal waste. And as a universal waste, it's subject to less regulatory requirements. So you don't necessarily have to uh, follow all the regulations when it comes to universal waste. So EPA proposed to make aerosol cans a universal waste. Now, at the bottom, some states, uh, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Ohio, Utah, already include cans as universal waste. So basically, some states are, are out in front of EPA, and if you're lucky being in one of those states, uh, the, your aerosol can is already considered a universal waste. Oh, well, let's talk about China's Blue Sky Initiative. Now, this is interesting because this has had major ramifications literally across the U.S. and across the world. I mean, time doesn't uh, permit for us to get into the details, but I just wanted to put this up on your radar screen. Uh, basically, in July of 2017, China said, uh, we're going to close or restrict waste scrap imports into the into China. And, and, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, we don't think it was going to happen. Well, beginning January 1st of 2018, China just instituted that policy. And basically what they said, is that we are no longer going to take the world's garbage. Uh, we're going to impose a limit that you can only have a contamination rate of 0.5%. We will not accept bales of waste material into our country with a high level of contamination because basically the world got lazy. Uh, China is willing to take a lot of this stuff because China's resource constrained, and China said, we, are no, we don't have room for this anymore, and we don't want your junk. Uh, and basically, they literally had people at the loading docks opening up bales and refusing bales to be to be uh, shipped over to China for recycling. Uh, the impact, basically, uh, was that China was taking, believe it or not, 51% of the worldwide scrap paper. China was taking 57% of the worldwide scrap plastics. Let those two numbers sink in. Same thing, sink in for a second. Um, they were taking almost 60% of the scrap plastics in the world was being shipped to China for recycling. And the world said, oh, well, we're recycling this stuff. It's going out to the curb. It's going away. We don't care. Uh, when China said, well, look, we can't take it. We don't want it anymore. The contamination rate is, is incredibly high, and we're running out of places for it, and we don't want it. 
And so it's caused literally ramifications because a whole bunch of other countries in the Southeast Asia market uh, actually stopped taking plastics. Uh, it's like a domino. And they're like, well, we don't want the stuff left over. Malaysia actually just sent uh, back to Canada shipments of waste that, that exceeded the contamination limit. Um, so anyhow, here's a graphical representation. Here's what was happening with China in terms of mixed waste paper. And you can see that starting January 18, the bottom literally just dropped out. Um, same thing with plastics. Uh, plastics are are the dark blue area, and you also saw for waste paper it came down, and also copper scrap. You can see the the impact was phenomenal, and and so now it's caused literally across the U.S. Uh, and across the world uh, a tremendous hard rethinking of what we're doing with solid waste. Uh, we, there are some communities that can no longer will accept waste for recycling. Uh, the materials that were accepted for recycling are not getting recycled. They're getting landfill because there's no capacity for it. It's just it threw a shock into the entire world. But from our perspective, there's major ramifications because brands are taking a hard look at packaging. Brands are taking a hard look at commitments uh, and are forcing changes down through the supply chain. So it is something that really needs to be examined and looked at. As I said, um, we don't have time to delve into all the ramifications, but understand it's out there and it's having a huge impact in our industry uh, as well as other industries, right? So let's turn our attention to OSHA. Again, regulatory reform, OSHA withdrew a bunch of rules from consideration. Uh, probably the most significant was the Injury and Illness Prevention Program, where OSHA was going to make companies develop a written program where you had to do a complete hazard analysis of your entire facility uh, and identify those opportunities for improvement, shall we say, and what programs and procedures you're going to put in place. Uh, we, we protested. We thought that it wasn't necessary given all the other regu OSHA regulations that are currently in place. Um, they were modeling after a couple other states. Uh, California is one, for example, that requires an illness and injury prevention program. So uh, luckily they got pulled uh, from, uh, at, from consideration. The rules that are still being considered by OSHA uh, improve tracking of workplace injury and illnesses. Powered industrial trucks, uh, the powered industrial truck, uh, basically they want to update the standard and they're asking about training requirements. Uh, if you're familiar with what's required for powered industrial trucks, you have to do initial training and training every three years. Uh, and also they reference the 1969 ANSI standard for powered industrial trucks, so they want to update it and they're looking for, look for feedback. Um, and then the HASCOM standard, which we have a slide to talk about. From an enforcement perspective, um, O OSHA is, has now authority and they take advantage of their authority to increase their penalties based on the cost of living index. And so from 2017 to 2018, there was an increase across the board in all the penalties. And really the significance of what this means to you is that if OSHA visits your facility and they find a uh, violation, they can fine you up to uh, $12,000. $934 for each violation. And based on my experience, depending upon the types of violations that they're seeing, uh, sometimes they lump them together and sometimes they itemize them. Uh, but right now we're seeing a significant increase. Uh, we've seen a significant increase in the penalties. Uh, and also if you're, uh, if you're found to be uh, willful violating or if you, re if you have a repeat violation, the maximum penalty can climb up to $130,000 per instance. Um, and so it is now uh, very significant. The penalties are much greater than they ever were. And OSHA is very uh, comfortable with issuing maximum penalties and, and citing and doing itemizations on citations. One thing I wanted to do real quick was just run down through our top 10. The reason why I provide you these top 10 violations in the printing industry is I do this every year. Uh, I like to, first of all, if you're looking at your OSHA compliance program and you say, hey, where do we start? I say, look at the top 10. Because these are what OSHA is commonly finding in terms of violations in printing operations. HASCOM is number one. That's the chemical uh, safety training program. And because the industry, unfortunately, is, is deemed a high hazard industry for amputations, there's been a lot of focus on your lockout tagout program and machine guarding, and that's number two and number three. Control hazardous energy is lockout tagout program, and 1910.212, uh, uh, general requirements for all machines, that's machine guarding, and there's another machine guarding one uh, in, our, in our top 10. 
respiratory protection, which is very interesting because to me, uh, there should not be many instances where respirators are required. My my suspicion here is that uh, people are handing out respirators, and you should not just hand out a respirator without having a full-blown respirator program. Powered industrial trucks, again, OSHA wants to update the standard. What I see here is lack of training. I've worked with many members uh, that cannot document the fact that they provided training to their operators, and then you have to do that uh, reevaluation every three years. When it comes to OSHA, you have to document everything. Documentation, documentation, documentation. Uh, number six, for personal protective equipment, we're required to evaluate a workplace to make sure people have the appropriate PPE. You have to identify that as an employer. And then, interesting enough, it's, this is a typo, it says writing method. It should be wiring methods. Um, 303, uh, 305 and 303, number seven and number nine, go hand in glove. Basically, that's electrical safety. I see lots of violations in printing operations. Um, do not use an extension cord to power anything. Do not use a power strip to power any industrial equipment. And I see in many instances, people take a an extension cord, stick it in a power strip, and then they use that to power production equipment. That'll guarantee get you generally a two to three thousand dollar OSHA penalty. Uh, we just had a facility with a forty six thousand dollar penalty. They had a proposed penalty of five thousand dollars for not labeling their breaker boxes. Uh, we see a lot of bad pendant drops. So from a wiring perspective, there's a lot of opportunities for improvement. Mechanical power transmission apparatus, as I said, that's the other machine guarding part. Basically, the difference between the two is that this standard covers uh, pulleys and drive chains and things like that. So it's the thing that actually making the equipment move. And the other machine guarding standard are the hazard areas, ingoing nip points and pinch points, reciprocating arms, things like that. And then portable fire extinguishers, very interesting. Uh, if you have portable fire extinguishers, which every facility does have, uh, two things. One, make sure they get annually inspected. Make sure you're doing monthly checks and make sure whoever you expect to use a fire extinguisher gets trade on an annual basis. What happens in a lot of instances, people don't, are not doing the training, they're not documenting the training, and OSHA will ask an employee, uh, do you, would you, if there was a fire, would you use a fire extinguisher? Most employees would say, heck yeah, I'm going to use a fire extinguisher. Uh, net result is then they say, well, show me the training records. And then if you can't produce training records, you're getting a fine. Injury and illness reporting, very important. This was instituted a couple years ago. Uh, we are now literally into the third year of reporting, uh, which is interesting. So um, this is a requirement that if you have more than 20 employees, and if it's full-time, part-time, uh, temporary employees, the magic number is 20, you have to submit your Form 300A data on an annual basis. Form 300A is the log. It's a summary of injury and illnesses that you keep on the log Form 300. That's the thing that you post every February 1st through April 30th. So if you have not uploaded your data, the last time I checked, they're still taking it. The deadline for 2018 data was March 2nd of 2019. The, de the deadline for 2019 data will be March 2nd of 2020. So if you have not uploaded your data, and understand OSHA is inspecting, they are citing companies for not uploading their data, um, you want to make sure that you've done that. You have to actually go on to their website, set up an account, and then upload the data to them for injury reporting. HASCOM standards, probably the biggest thing going on right now with HASCOM is that OSHA has said, um, and again, they've missed the February 2019 deadline, and they've actually just issued a couple weeks ago an extension, and so we're going to look at the fall. But basically, OSHA is going to update the HASCOM standard. Now, this is a bit of a challenge because we just went through a big revision of the hazard communication standard back in 2012, where OSHA said we're going to we're going to join the rest of the world. We're going to we're going to pull up and and incorporate what's called the Global Harmonization System or GHS elements into our into our HASCOM, and they gave us a long phasing period. Um, you had to have done training by December 1st of 2013, but by now, uh, everything that you should have in place, um, you should have safety data sheets, no longer material safety data sheets for at least all new products, existing stuff on the shelves, you can still have MSDSs. You need to have pictograms on the labels, you have to have a new secondary container labeling system. And OSHA said, well, geez, when we did this, um, we only adopted the third version. Well, what happens with the rest of the world is they're a lot faster on making changes to GHS, and they're now on the seventh edition. So OSHA said, I think they may even be working on the eighth edition. OSHA said, we're going to at least catch up to the seventh edition. That's going to be our proposal. Uh, but again, we haven't seen the final. We haven't seen the final proposal. They haven't released anything. So, uh, but they said it's coming. Um, so there we are with the updates to the global harmonization. Now, lockout tagout, very important. 
Lockout tagout is the regulation uh, that to me, uh, well, it goes, then maybe a step back. There's two regulations that protect employees during equipment operation. The first one is machine guarding, the second one is lockout tagout. Machine guarding re regulation applies whenever the equipment's doing its intended function. Paper's going through the press, it's going through the cutter. Um, though that regulation says all uh, hazards must be provided the, with a physical machine guard to prevent an employee from coming in contact with that and, and getting injured. Now, once you stop that piece of equipment and you have to bypass a guard or lift a guard or stick your hand around the guard or put yourself in a hazardous area on a piece of equipment, now think of a die cutter, for example, um, the lockout tagout standard applies. And what lockout tagout standard says is that you have to turn all the power off to the equipment, de-energize it, isolate it, uh, and prevent someone from turning it on while you have an employee that's in that area of exposure. So that's kind of the concept. Now, <clears throat> As an industry, we make our living in the exception, and there's an exception to the lockout tagout standard. The exception basically says that for minor servicing and maintenance activities, uh, employees can perform those if there's a form of alternative equivalent protection, and that's key. Got to have alternative equivalent protection. We have a letter from 1992 from OSHA, interpretation letter from 92 and 2006, that basically says we can use what's called the inch safe service method, which means that if you have equipment that meets the ANSI standard and you use the uh, stop safe system, you can do things like change plates, clear minor paper jams, do minor make ready activities without having to turn all the power off. So the reason why we're able to do that is we're able to show that the employee was protected from unexpected energization. The key word is unexpected. So. Oh, uh, the previous administration under Obama in 2016 proposed to remove that word unexpected from the regulation. If that would have happened, um, as an industry, we'd be out of business, period. We hang our hat on the fact that we're protecting employees from unexpected energization through the use of the inch safe service method. The good news is that um, that proposed rule did not go through as proposed. We and about 145 other industry groups screamed from the mountaintops that this would put us out of business. So OSHA, under this administration, issued a regulation in May of 2019 that is not removing the word unexpected. Well, that's the big hurdle. Here's the kicker. They proposed to remove uh, proposed to remove it due to losing, well, several court cases. We won't go into that. But they said they're going to further consider the issue in the review of the overall standard. So it, literally a week after they issued that, they issued what's called a request for information on the lockout tagout standard. Under that standard, they've got 33 specific questions that they want to know. And they want information on the protection provided by modern, reliable control systems that don't require equipment to be de-energized. And they also want to know about safety systems for robots. And here's the issue, is that under the standard improvement project, they decided not to remove the word unexpected. The consensus is, is that they are going to remove it through this rulemaking process. So as a result, we're forming a task force and have invited other industry associations to join us to put forth a unified position saying to OSHA is that you cannot remove uh, what we've gained with respect to the unexpected energization using in safe service. In addition, you may notice on newer equipment, there are some new, con new modern reliable control circuitry that have dual control redundant circuits that do allow us to access equipment while it's energized. Understand OSHA's position on this whole thing is that they want equipment to be completely e zero energy. They want no power when you do anything to it. And that puts us out of business. We have to have power to equipment. So those of you familiar with a guillotine cutter, for example, try to change a guillotine cutter blade with no power. It's impossible. You can't do it. You have to bring power. You have to bring the blade down so you can get the bolts out of the blade to remove the, the, the blade from the, from the cutter. So this is huge for us as an industry, and we've got to make sure OSHA understands the significance and that they cannot remove uh, from the standard, the, the uh, protections that we've built in for our employees so that we can safely use equipment in an economical fashion. As I mentioned, the Amputation Prevention Program, I mean, Amputation Prevention National Emphasis Program is going on right now. Uh, OSHA came back and said um, it includes all of the printing industry because we have high and large significant numbers of amputations occurring. And basically, when they come in to do one of these inspections, they're looking at lockout, tagout, machine guarding, and looking at unsafe practices. And you can see from our top 10, 
OSHA violations, lockout, tag out, and machine guarding are in our top 10. They carry large dollar penalties. Uh, they're going to hit you in the ten to $12,000 range for these violations. And if they find uh, three things wrong with your lockout, tag out program, expect that they'll, they'll get you three times for that amount. Um, and so we see some rather significant uh, proposed penalties coming through for companies that, that do not have lockout tag on in place or are having issues with machine guarding or don't have machine guards. Why is that the case? Well, here's the case. If we look at the numbers and statistics, again, this is from 2017. From 2011 to 2017, in our industry, we had experienced 330 amputations. And think about that. I want that to set in a second. 330 amputations. That means... 330 people, coworkers, individuals, family members in our industry experience some type of amputation. And these amputations could be um, minor, although how do you define a minor amputation? It could be a fingertip, it could be a finger, it could be a hand, it could be an arm, it could be part of an arm. Um, in addition, we average uh, three fatalities a year in the printing industry, and usually those fatalities are equipment related. And generally what that boils down to is that someone's inside a piece of equipment and someone turns it on. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, so because we have these high numbers, now I am encouraged. I mean, I, I've been preaching from the mountaintops on amputation prevention uh, for years and years and years. I am encouraged, at least I'm hoping, that if I see the trend from 2016 to 2017, we saw a drop. I'm hoping that when we get the 2018 data later this year, uh, again, they're two years behind, when we get the 2018 data, we'll see a further reduction uh, because hopefully these numbers are headed in the right direction. But as an industry, we do have a lot of extremely bad habits. I see tons of bad habits out there uh, that we need to correct and we need to be diligent about correcting those. So as I promised, I've got a video I want to show. Uh, it'll, it'll run very quickly. Basically with this video, and, and you can, you can uh, decide to uh, not watch it because after this we'll open up for questions. Basically what this video shows is a, a common practice. What happens, I see a lot, um, is that we rely in our industry on interlocks. Interlocks are basically uh, safety switches so that you know when you lift a guard or if you pull a piece of, uh, of a, um, say for example, platform, uh, generally it's more commonly th thought about as guards. When you move a guard out of the way, there's a safety switch that says, oh, the equipment can't run because that safety switch has now been engaged. What happens, um, two things. One, uh, most more commonly, people defeat those safety switches and then people don't tell you about defeating those safety switches. I have countless horror story after horror story I can share with you uh, where operators went up to a piece of equipment, someone had defeated the safety switch, didn't know it, thought that the equipment was going to stop when they did X, Y, Z, and it didn't, and they got pulled into the equipment. The other thing is they fail. And when they fail, they don't always set on an alarm saying, hey, by the way, you better check the switch on guard on unit number three because uh, the, safety, the, the interlock has failed, and so therefore, you know, you better check. So in this particular instance, this was an interlock. This is basically a horizontal press. You'll see what happens to the operator. Um, again, uh, I can only say assumes uh, that the safety system had been engaged and goes into the piece of equipment to service it, and, and you'll see what happens. Um, and, and you'll see this is a far view, and you'll see it'll get a little closer. So it's the operator. Uh, she's at the control station. She's doing something. So she's pulling, going in to pull out the piece of work that had been stamped, right? Uh, takes the work off, uh, goes back in to do something. I suspect make an adjustment, and you can see what happens. Extremely unfortunate. So you had someone who had to come over and, and stop the equipment and, and, and try to remove her from that piece of equipment. Um, and I can say it was a very tragic accident. So um, again, I, I, I preach from the from from the um, soapbox in terms of equipment. We have got to stop our bad habits. We've got to take this more seriously. We've got to establish safe operating procedures and then enforce those safe operating procedures. So. At this point, Roz, I'll turn it over to you to see if anybody has any questions, and we can go through those. Thank you, Gary. Um, well, we don't have any questions that have been typed in yet, but um, I invite all of you to to write something in if you have a burning question, and in the last couple of minutes, we will address those. Um, I want everyone to know that I will make this presentation available to you. I'm going to email it to you uh, right after um, this webinar ends so that you'll have it and you can review it um, at your leisure. Um, and so 
while hopefully we're we're getting a couple of questions, Gary, I have a question for you. Um, sure. In in your earlier slides, you were talking about the the deregulation and decrease in regulatory costs in the Trump administration. Um, and so with that level of deregulation, and so much of it is around environmental impacts um, and, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, um, which, you know, encompass a number of different types of, of uh, chemicals, that in combination with the fact that greenhouse gas emissions have increased by 40% since 1990, do you anticipate that um, in the next couple of years or if Trump gets another term in office that states will take over and sort of get in front of this reduction in environmental regulation? I mean, we're well, seeing in the label industry... Yeah. We're seeing we're seeing the market. We're seeing our our customers and retailers and brands and end users really putting pressure on their supply chains to say, you know, I want to know how much you're doing to help this final product have a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions through your manufacturing and well, and you right. know all yeah. of this through through your work with the Sustainable Green Printing Partnership, but. What, what's your prediction there in your crystal ball? Well, uh, I mean, I would say we don't even we don't even have to look down the road. I would say that you have uh, states are taking action already. Um, for example, New York State um, has passed some new legislation. You have um, oh, New Jersey rejoining the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative (RGGI), which is a trading program for greenhouse gases. State of Washington just passed legislation saying that they, by 2025, they want to be completely renewable. California has passed legislation, I believe. I'm not sure the date of which they said, but they want to go completely renewable energy by a date certain. Um, so you do have <clears throat> you do have some states taking action. Uh, in, as I said, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. That's a, a lot of the states on the East Coast that are that are that have set caps and are doing an, a, um, a a trading, so to speak, of of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So, you, so I and, and Virginia also is a state that just recently said that they want to do uh, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, you do have the states uh, kind of taking the lead and. You know, um, I'm not saying I'm not defending or 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 or, propo or um, defending or or um, um, you know uh, I don't know supporting this, but the the philosophy of the Trump administration, uh, and this is carried through on their EPA enforcement initiative, is they dr they're driving many things back to the states. In other words, part of the philosophy is it should not be uh, federal control over, over, over everything and that states should be able to allow themselves the opportunity to, to set limits. So the, the, the Affordable Clean Energy Plan is clearly they took and dumped it back into the laps of the states with guidance and said to the states, you set the emission limits. Under the Clean Power Plan, the federal government set very stringent, very stiff limits. Um, again, I think they were beyond their legal mandate, and that's an issue too in terms of legislative, because you may have need to see legislative movement to get some of the more aggressive limits that that uh, might be necessary gotcha. for the greenhouse gas. So, yeah, I, I would say it's happening now, and I would say you know you have um, a lot of states that are being very aggressive in this front, and and I think forces like that, you know, once you get enough states doing something, you almost end up with a national mandate. You know what I mean? So right. uh, it is yeah. a very interesting dynamic. So, Well, thank you, Gary. Um, we have no further questions. Um, so, folks, I will get that presentation out to you today with Gary's contact information. So if yeah. any questions do come to mind, you can reach out directly to Gary. So yeah, thank you on the, so on much, the, yeah. Time, Gary. Sure, no problem, Roz. On my last slide is my contact info. So if people have questions, please think about it. Reach out to me. I'm here to help. So. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a great rest uh -huh. of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.